Okay, we are jumping right into another series. The series title is called A Journey Through Philippians. And so we're going to work through this book of Philippians. It's an incredible book. Uh, It's a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. Uh, Paul's writing this, this letter to the church in Philippi while he is on house arrest. The church in Philippi was planted during Paul's second missionary journey. And so he's writing to the church of Philippi to encourage them in their work. They're doing something. Tell somebody they were doing something. They were doing what the church is supposed to do, something. Come on, somebody. All right. So Paul's writing to encourage them in their work. We read about Paul's visit. You can, you can read uh, bits and pieces of Paul's visit uh, to, uh, ph- actually, he's on his way to Macedonia, and ph- Philippi is the first place that he comes to in the region of Macedonia. Some of the stories that you read about in Acts chapter 16 are what's happening while Paul is in Philippi. Do you remember the story of the, the slave girl? who was following Paul, and she was saying, these men are proclaiming the way of salvation, but she was doing by doing so by a spirit of divination. And Paul, operating in the gift of discernment, turned and he rebuked the evil spirit and cast it out of her, and her masters became incredibly angry because she provided a great source of income for them. And the result of Paul casting out a demon and setting a little girl free was him and Silas were thrown into prison. And it was in that prison cell that after being beaten, Paul and Silas woke up and instead of being bitter towards God, instead of questioning God and the circumstance that they find themselves in, like a lot of us would do, oh God, woe is me, poor me, I can't believe, God, you've left me and you've you've abandoned me to this place of, of utter despair. Instead of doing what most of us would do, they looked around and they said, even yet, we will praise him. And they begin to worship, and in the midst of their worship, the word, the, 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 the spirit of God interceded into the earthquake shook the foundations of the ground and the prison doors whom sprung open and everyone there ran away to escape imprisonment no they stayed in the middle of prison when the doors were wide open because they found out in a moment that true freedom isn't in where the world has to offer but true freedom is found in the presence of the Lord and they were captivated in the midst of the spirit of God and the jailer came running in thinking for sure that they had all escaped and he was ready to take his own life. But Paul speaks life to him and he says, hey, we're still here. And they took and they gave this message of the gospel to the jailer and he and his whole family got saved. Revival broke out in the middle of a prison in in, in, in Philippi. Good stuff. Good stuff. That's kind of where the foundation of what we're, we're laying right here is. Okay, so Paul, he is now, years have passed. He's been arrested. He's now waiting to be able to have his time in front of the powers that be in Rome, and he's writing letters to to, to the churches of of the New Testament, the epistles that we read, and that's what he's doing. He's reading, he's writing this epistle to the church in Philippi. So we're going to just kind of go through this um, kind of in a verse-by-verse fashion and just see what we can glean from what the Word of God says. You good? You ready? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. I pray, Lord, that as it goes forth, that it would accomplish everything that it's set to do. You're faithful to your word. You're faithful to the production of your word. You're faithful to the fruit of your word. And I thank you, Lord, that you're faithful to the promises of your word. And you said that when good fruit goes forth and it falls on good ground, that it will produce a fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. And so, Lord, I pray that you would prepare us not just for the word, but you would prepare your people for the produce from your word in our lives and through us. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. In your name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Amen. Hey, before we uh, go back into worship, we will be taking and receiving communion together. If you have not received your communion cups yet, don't worry. Don't get, don't get, don't, you know, don't, don't rush to the back. Before we go, we'll have our, uh, some elders and, and others who are ready to serve walk through and, and make sure you have your communion cups. So let's just start in verse 1. Paul's introduction, it says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The first point, if you're taking notes along with us, you can, you can label your first point that you want to put down as thanksgiving, praise, and promise. Thanksgiving, praise, and promise. Verses 3 through 6 is really what we're covering here. Thanksgiving, praise, and promise. He goes on in verse 3, I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for you all. And he goes on, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. In verse 6, he says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So backing up to verse 3 and 4, Paul's reminding us, right, because we, we say all the time that the word of God is informational, right, it's historical, and it's applicable to our lives today, amen? So whenever we're reading the word, we want to know what the word says, we want to know what the word, what, what the writer, what the author is speaking to those who are reading, but we also want to read to understand what God is saying to us. Because God's word is alive. What God has spoken, he is still speaking. Amen? So when I get in the word, I don't just want to understand the historical value or the historical context. I come into the word to meet with the author. I want to know what God has to say to me. So Paul's writing, and he's writing to the church, and he's letting them know something vitally important. He says, I'm always offering prayer for you with joy in my every prayer for you all. Paul's reminding us, what can you take from this? He's reminding you to be faithful to pray. Be faithful to pray. Guys, some of these things that we, I mean, this is foundational stuff. Oftentimes, we, we, we overcomplicate some of the things that God has called us to. If you are a believer, if your life is in Christ, you are called to pray. Prayer is a weapon. We're going to talk about this. Paul, Paul's not using churchy language. He's not trying to sound super spiritual. He's letting the church in Philippi know that they are covered. He's saying, like, you, you, you guys, you're in my prayers. My prayers are going before you because that's what prayer does. When you understand prayer is not just giving God a laundry list or a grocery list of what you need him to do for you in order for you to be blessed, come on. Paul's letting the church know, listen, God is calling you to something and you have prayer going before you because prayer prepares the way. Prayer is preparing the way for you to walk in what God is calling you to do. So be confident that you're in my prayers. We need to get back to a place of covering our steps, covering what God has called us to in prayer. I'm convinced now more than ever in the importance of prayer. I mean, guys, it is vital to what God is calling us to, to walk where God is calling us, to be the light in darkness that God is calling us to. You cannot think that we could shine forth as the morning sun, as the word declares that we are to, if we are not bathed and covered in prayer. We need to be a praying church. So if you have an opportunity to pray, pray. If you have an opportunity for us to come together in a time of prayer, Come together for a time of prayer with an expectation that the God of miracles will move because prayer in faith moves the hand of God. Why? Guys, because prayer is powerful and God hears you. You know God hears you when you pray? You can, we, I've, I've taught on prayer a lot, but, we're, but remember, I'm just reminding some people here, according to John, uh, John 5, 14, that if you ask anything, According to his will, he hears you. If you want to know that God turns his ear to your whispers, you pray according to his will. I said last week or a couple of weeks ago, you know, I'd love to have a, a, a red Corvette, but I'm not praying for it. I'm praying for lives to be saved. I'm praying for the sanctity of life because that's God's will. 
I'm praying for, 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 our, for the generations raising up to be raised up in righteousness because that's the will of God. I'm praying for the sick to be healed. I'm praying for the lost to be saved because this is the will of God. I'm praying for those possessed and oppressed to be set free because I believe that is the will of God to do those things. And if I'm praying according to his will, I can be confident that he hears me. Why do we need to pray? Because our Father in heaven hears us. That's powerful. Prayer is partnership with God. Why is prayer powerful? Why is prayer vital? Because when we pray in accordance with his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, the word tells us that we will have what we ask. It's partnership with God. That's what prayer is. Three, prayer is a key that unlocks heaven's agenda. Prayer is a key to the kingdom, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. That's what Jesus said. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed on heaven, in heaven. You see, our prayers are partnership with heaven's agenda to see his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How do we see heaven released on earth? It begins in pray. Prayer is a weapon. Come on. Come on. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. For the pulling down of strongholds, prayer is a weapon. It is a weapon that God utilizes to break things in the spirit, to set into motion the things of the kingdom. Prayer precedes miracles. All throughout the word of God, we see prayer giving birth to the miraculous. And it hasn't stopped. And it hasn't stopped. The miracles that we are believing for will happen because we're praying into them. We should not ever be afraid to pray Seemingly impossible prayers because those are the ones that God loves to answer. Come on. Prayer precedes miracles. So let's, let's take Paul's words to us, to the church of Philippi and to you, because that's who he's writing. Let's take these words and let them be an example to each one of us to take seriously this call to pray. Take seriously this call to pray. In verse 5, re- reveals why Paul is faithful to pray for them. Why is Paul faithful to pray diligently and fervently for the church in Philippi? Well, it tells us because of your participation in the gospel. Amen. See, the gospel, you know, most of you, some of you, know that gospel means good news of the kingdom. Yeah. That's, that's, that's that word. That's what it, that's what it breaks down. That, that's the definition of it. To the good news of the kingdom now and to come. The message of the gospel was the message that Jesus preached. The good news of the kingdom now and to come. Mark 1, 14 and 15, it says that Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God or the gospel of the kingdom and saying this is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel is the answer, Scott. The gospel is the answer to the problems that we see. The good news of the kingdom, the restorative work that's offered through Christ, the redemption that is available through a relationship with Jesus. It's the gospel. The gospel is the hope for humanity. But we notice in the life of Jesus, the proclamation of the gospel was always accompanied with a demonstration of the kingdom. You can't separate them. Where Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom, he demonstrated the good news of the kingdom. When Jesus preached about the good news of the kingdom, he demonstrated that which flows from the kingdom. When Jesus preached, the deaf heard the dead were raised, the blind saw, the lepers were healed. Come on. 
It doesn't stop. Where there was a proclamation, there was a demonstration. We need to understand, listen, the importance of believing that the same God who raised Christ from the dead, the same spirit is alive in us. And what Jesus began was not to show us what was impossible, but what Jesus did in the life that he lived was to reveal what was available to anyone who would believe. This is the work of the kingdom. And I want you to know that you are in a house that unapologetically, unapologetically believes that what God has done, he is still doing today. That we believe without a doubt that it is God and God alone through Jesus Christ who saves us. We believe that salvation is available through other name but Jesus. We believe unapologetically in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe that healing happens. We believe that healing and salvation and deliverance is for today. We don't apologize for it because it's what Jesus demonstrated. We need to understand that the gospel of the kingdom is tangible. It's not just informational. It's not just for knowledge. It's tangible. And if you believe the gospel, listen, friends, if you believe the gospel, if the gospel, if the work of Christ has been applied to your life, listen, it should have and it should continually be moving you towards some sort of kingdom work. Some sort of kingdom work. Maybe not everyone's called to be a pastor or preacher, but everyone is called to the work of the kingdom. Everyone is called to the work of the kingdom. So how does one participate in the gospel? Paul says, this is why I'm praying for you. Because of your participation in the gospel. Paul's, Paul's saying that this is why I'm covering you because you're doing the stuff. Well, participation in the gospel is twofold. The first part of the participation in the gospel is what the gospel has done in you. If you are a benefactor of the cross, then the gospel, the work of the gospel has done something in you. If you are saved, you are participating in the gospel. There's been participation with the work of the gospel in your life. If you have been redeemed, there's participation. So you have this side of the participation that is you saying yes to Jesus. And now the participation of what Jesus through his blood has made available is applied to you. That's participation. So you have participation on the front side, which is what God has done for you. But there's another side of participation. It's what God can do through you. Hello? There's another side of the gospel. Tell somebody there's another side. There's another side of this participation that you're called to. It's not just about what I can get from the cross. It's about that when my life, who is Christ, when my life is found in Christ, it's not just about what he has done for me. It's about being so so, oh man, just covered and so absolutely to the end of myself to realize my life is not my own. And now, because of what you've done, it's moving something in me. What God has done in me is one side, but now what God wants to do through me is the other side. That's the participation we're called to. It's twofold. Tell somebody, it's not just about you. Come on. That's fun to say in church. It's not just about you. If God has done something in you, it's so he can do something through you. Come on. That's fun. This is life in the kingdom. This is what you're called to. See, your faith in the gospel, Paul's praying, your faith in the gospel has brought you to a, a place of submission to his lordship. It's Christ, in Christ, resulting in new life in him. But it should not stop there. For this life of mine that has been transformed by the power of the gospel is now in subjection to Christ and his call for me to participate in the work of the gospel. There's work to be done, friends. 
There's work to be done. Participating in the work of the gospel is a foundation in Paul's writing to the church of Philippi. This is how he's opening the letter. We're five, we're five verses in. You, know, you guys know that in Paul's letter, he didn't have verses. There weren't numbers. We're still in the, intro, the introductory paragraph here. Paul's saying, I'm praying for you because of the work God has called you to. It's going to need to be covered because it's an important work. He's championing them. Guys, he's saying, your belief has moved you to action. God did something in you, and now you're allowing God to do something through you. And I'm praying for you. Listen, you were not saved, sanctified, justified, redeemed, transformed, and set free in order that you could just sit back and do nothing. Come on. Freely you've received, now freely give. Freely you've received, now freely give. Guys, here's the, like, I, I had this thought, and I've, I've mentioned this before. But the reality is, like, I, you guys, a lot of you know my story. I went to uh, the University of Illinois to play football. My freshman year, I had a career-ending injury. I thought my life was over because my identity was wrapped up in what I did, not in whose I was. Come on, somebody. Anyone been there? But I remember, like, after having three surgeries on my foot, I was sitting on, a si on the sideline for one of our games, and it was probably the most depressed I've ever been. On the sideline at a U of I football game while we're playing, I think we were playing Purdue, and I remember just this overwhelming despair that I was in. And the thought that just kept going through my mind while I was watching my friends do what I wanted to do, while I was watching my friends run and make plays and tackle and hearing the crowd cheer, what was going through my mind, I was just, I remember just thinking, T.W., I wasn't made for the sidelines. Yet the sidelines is where a lot of the church lives their life. Just, just in, they're okay with being in the stadium. Guys, I'm not okay with being in the stadium. I'm not okay with being on the sideline. You are called to a place of participation with the gospel. You're called to get in the game. Tell your neighbor, get in the game. There's work to be done. There's work to be done. And if you are sitting around doing nothing, you're missing out. All right, I'm sorry for preaching so hard. Well, I might offend somebody, Bobby. Oh. If a call to champion you to do something offends you, be offended. I'm just saying it. <laughs> Come on, let's go. I'll kick you. Let's go in Jesus' name. Uh, faithfulness and obedience is what you see in Paul's letter. This is point two. Verse six. He says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He who began the good work will complete it. Honestly, guys, this has been a life verse for Tina and I. Whenever we, uh, whenever we started our life as, you know, in, in full-time ministry as missionaries with YWAM, traveling all over the world, this was the, the verse that we put on the top of our letters that we sent out to people because we believed that, that God was able to finish what he started. God is able because God is faithful. Is he able because he's powerful? Absolutely. But he's willing because he's faithful. God is the faithful one. So Paul's reminding the church of Philippi and he's reminding some of you today that he is faithful. Some of you find yourself waiting, wondering, God, are you going to come through? God, are you going to finish it? God, are you going to bring them back? And I feel like there is a reminding word from the Lord this morning to let you know that he is faithful to complete the work that he started. It's the word. You can't get away from it. That word confident, that word confident means to be persuaded. Paul says, I've been persuaded. You're persuaded by evidence. 
You know, whenever you're, if, if you're, in a, if you're a, a part of a jury in a trial, evidence is given in order to persuade you so that you can make a confident decision on the verdict. So Paul is telling you that one way to become confident is through the evidence that is given. Another way that you can become confident or be persuaded is by experience. An experience that you've had. Guys, I am confident in God's word because I have seen and I have witnessed enough evidence I have the evidence of God's faithfulness throughout his word. I've witnessed the evidence of God's faithfulness through the lives of others, and I have experienced the faithfulness of God in my own life. Therefore, I can say I'm confident. Tell somebody I'm confident. I'm confident because I've been persuaded by the evidence that he's provided and the experience that I've had. I'm confident. Paul's telling them, I'm confident in this. Paul's writing to the church. He's saying, listen, I know you're doing a good work. I know that the work is big and I know that it seems daunting, but trust me, even if you, sometimes you gotta have faith for other people. Sometimes you have to be a place of strength for others in your life. Sometimes you have to be a foundation that when others are wavering, that they can come back to and say, man, I need a word right now. I need a prayer right now. I, because right now, my confidence is weighing. Paul is writing to a church and he's saying, listen, I know that your confidence may be waning, but I'm been, I've been persuaded because I've seen his faithfulness time and time and time again. I've experienced his faithfulness time and time and time again. And he who began a good work in you will carry it out until completion all the way until the day of Christ Jesus. That's long-term faithfulness. Are you hearing me this morning? He is faithful. Someone needs to hear this. Even when you have failed, even when you have been unfaithful, he's faithful. You have a part to play. God is faithful, but listen, you have a part to play. God's part is faithfulness. Your part is obedience. God's part is faithfulness. Your part is obedience. Obedience, listen, we're bringing it back to participation. Your obedience is the part participation that Paul is celebrating. That's participation. When you're obedient to his word, when you are obedient to his calling, ha, huh, you're now in partnership with his faithfulness. That's how the work's completed. Amen? His faithfulness is on all sides. His, the faithfulness to complete the work, but also to meet us and to lead her into a deeper places of relationship with him. See, when you're obedient, you will see God's faithfulness time and time again. In that, you can be confident. Number three, or number four, I'm sorry. Did I already give you number three? Yeah, faithfulness and obedience is three. Did I give you two? Sometimes I get ahead of my notes. One, I'm going to back up just so there's no, one is thanksgiving, praise, and promise. Two is how does one participate in the gospel. Three is faithful and obedience. Four is love, gifts, and righteousness. Starting in verse 7 through 11. For it's only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of this gospel that you are all partakers of. That you're partakers of grace with me. And he goes on in verse 8. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ. And 9. And this... I pray that your love may overflow, that your love may overflow still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may discover the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and blameless for the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ. 
for the glory and praise of God. In verses 9 through 11, Paul is mentioning to the church three pieces of the Christian faith. It would be easy to to just mistakenly uh, read right through them because it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of emphasis placed on them in this verse. But there will be throughout throughout the book of Philippians to even a greater degree. It would be easy to mistakenly read right through them because, as I said, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of emphasis. But we know that these three things mentioned are extremely important to Paul through the do, through, through, through what's listed throughout all of his letters. He mentions love. We know how important love is to Paul because Paul devotes the, the entire chapter of, of 13, the, the entire chapter 13 of Corinthians to the importance of love, describing what love is, what love does. We know that, we, that the gifts of the Spirit are important to Paul. Because he talks about them in, in Romans or uh, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 and 1 Corinthians. We know that righteousness is important to Paul because he talks about it in Romans 3, 4, 5, and chapters 10. All of these things are, are essentials that, that build up the body of Christ, and they are all the result of faith in Christ. In verse 9, again, he says, I pray that your love may overflow still more and more in real knowledge. He's praying that your love would overflow. Listen, that, well, you could say it like this. I'm praying that you would be filled up and run over with the love of God. <sighs> Paul wants the church to be aware of how much they're loved. He wants the individuals in the church of Philippi to know above all else that they are deeply loved by God. He wants you today, I believe that God wants you today to know that you are the bullseye of his affection, that you are loved unconditionally. He wants you to be sure of his love. This overflow, this overflow is so important because you can only overflow from that which fills you. He's saying like you need to be overflowing with my love for you, with God's love. The prayer is that you would be filled to overflow. And that word absolute knowledge is talking about an awareness that is achieved through learning and experience. He's saying, listen, I want you to have the knowledge, not just in, in, so that you can know, but knowledge available through experiencing the love of God. That your experience with the love of God would confirm how much you're loved. The prayer is that you would be filled experiencing the love of God. Listen, this is what he has for you. Experiencing the love of God that is for you, that is pure, that is true, that is never ending, that is without contingencies. Do you know that God loves you without contingencies? He loves you not based on you being good enough. The love that God has for you is not based on how good you've been. It's not based on how good you will be. God's love is without condition. It's unconditional love. That's the love that God wants you to be sure of. That's the love that God wants you to experience. It's not about you being good enough so that you will experience love. He's saying, no, you are loved because you're mine and that's enough. Paul says, I want you to be confident in this and overflow in this love. It's not about what you have done. It's not about how good you are. It's not reduced because you haven't been good enough. It's more than enough. The love that God has for you is more than enough. He wants you to be confident in this love. Love binds everything together. Overflowing from God's love. Overflowing from God's love allows us to move in discernment, moving from love. And this is what Paul is talking about, that you would would have all the knowledge and discernment to know that you're moving from love. See, sometimes if we're not careful, that's what Paul is writing to the church. He's saying, if you're not careful, you can start doing things that are good things, thinking that what you do will mean God loves you thinking that, that, that your actions 
will be the basis on which God can love you more. He's saying you need to have discernment to know that God loves you in spite of you and that you do because you're loved. We love because he first loved us. I do from love. What I do for him is not so that he'll love me. What I do for him is because he loved me. That's different. I'm not doing so that I'll be approved. I'm doing because I'm approved. That's a place of freedom. That's freedom that he has for us. That you would be sincere and blameless and filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Worship team can come out. We're going to come to a closing here. Righteousness, listen, is a gift that comes from being in the love of Christ. Righteousness is is the byproduct of that. Righteousness can be translated really simply to right standing with God. I stand before God just, not because of what I've done, but because of what Christ has done for me. I've been covered. I've been set free. I've been redeemed. I've been made righteous because he who knew sin, or he who knew no sin became sin. There was this exchange that took place. Jesus became the embodiment of sin when he took it upon himself to pay the price that I deserved. Why? So that he could move me from a place of sin, a place covered in shame, in guilt, in everything that sin produces, so that he could move me from where I was into a place of righteousness, where I stand now before him washed, clean, holy, made new, I'm not who I was, I've been born again into righteousness. The fruit of righteousness is living a life that affirms what Christ has done in me. I'm not striving for it, I'm living from it. I'm not striving for righteousness, I'm living from righteousness. If you'll get this, it will change your life. (laughs) Here we go. What did I just say? It was really important, okay? It was was life-changing, okay? But really, here's the truth. I promise you guys, it will change your life. Your life will be transformed if, if, if you catch this revelation that you're not living, that your call is not to live in order to be righteous, but you're living from a place of righteousness. When I live from righteousness, I realize there's a revelation that takes place that brings me to an understanding to know that I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm a slave to righteousness. So that which I spent years trying to battle in my own strength, trying to be righteous, there's freedom that comes from understanding that he has made me righteous. And now, because his righteousness has become a covering to me, I no longer am a slave to that which tried to hold me. Now I'm free to be as he's called me. If he's called me righteous, I'm free to be righteous. I'm a slave to righteousness, not a slave to sin. This is an identity thing. I don't live my life in the tension of struggling to try to be good. He's made me good. I'm not good, but he's good enough to make me good. It's simple. 
But I promise you, your enemy wants to cloud your mind and jumble your understanding of what righteousness in God is. There's freedom. There's absolute freedom available for everyone here. Righteousness is not earned, it's deposited. It's placed upon you. Not because of what you've done, but because of what Christ has done for you. He's brought you into something that you could not receive or earn on your own. Therefore, as Christ has called you, so you ought to be in Jesus' name. We're gonna celebrate communion together. Very quickly, uh, if you have not received this, can you just put your hand up in the air and we're gonna have uh, some help that's gonna just run through the aisles to be able to pass these out. So just keep your hand up until, the, until you get a tray. That'd be great, they're, they're running. This is good. Thank you guys so much for who are helping to pass these out. Just keep your hands up. This is good stuff. For those of you who have already received it, you can go ahead and take your wafer off of the top. It's two different peelbacks. You have your wafer and then also the uh, grape juice. Both of them are sealed up, so you can take them apart. And I'll just wait until everyone has received uh, communion who will move forward. In fact, while we're waiting for everyone to, to receive their communion cups, let's, let's just pray together. I think it's so important that we even prepare our hearts for what we're about to receive. If you haven't received it, just keep your hands up and someone will come to you. But the rest of us, let's just invite the Holy Spirit just to do some introspection in us. That we would just be in a place where, where we know that we are taking this in a worthy manner. I want you to know that the first thing that you have to question to discover whether you are taking communion in a worthy manner is this. Now listen, this is going to sound, this isn't me being harsh, but it's the truth of his word. First and foremost, the question has to be asked, are you in a living relationship with Jesus Christ? With every head bowed and every eye closed, just play, I just want you to hear these words. If you are not in a relationship with Jesus, if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, not according to TW, but according to the word, you would be receiving communion in an unworthy manner. The second is this. If you are here and you are participating in a sinful lifestyle, and you were to take communion, you would be taking communion in an unworthy manner. Not according to me, according to the word. So we need to, what the word says, it says examine yourself. Thankfully, neither one of these issues can be large enough to, to, be, to, to not be overcome even today in this moment. The first is very simple. If you're here and you know that Maybe, you've, maybe you have given your life to Christ in the past, but you have allowed sin to reign in your life. Man, praise the Lord that he's given you an opportunity to repent right now. So if you're here just right now, ask the Holy Spirit, are there areas in my life that I am letting sin have charge? And if there's something that's coming to your mind right now, repent of that thing. Ask for forgiveness of that thing. Say, Jesus, I know this does not glorify you. Re I repent of engaging in this. And it can be anything. It, 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 can, be, it can be gossip. It can be uh, worrying. It can be fear. All of those things are sinful things. It could, be, it could be having sex outside of marriage and giving yourself to that. It's sin. And Jesus paid the price for all of it because he wants you to be free. Whatever it is, if there's things the Lord is bringing to your mind right now, repent of those things quickly and say, Christ Jesus, forgive me. I turn from those things to follow you. Secondly, if you're here and you've never made 
the decision to submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, now is your chance. If you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I don't know that I've ever chosen to surrender my life to Jesus. Or I have in the past, but I've fallen away and I need to come to a place. I need to come to the cross again and rededicate my life. Very simply, in this moment, if your heart is turning back to him, it's not a prayer that saves you. It is the Spirit of God by by what Christ Jesus has made available. He sees a heart that's turning to him, but if that's you, Every one of us are going to pray this prayer together. And if that's you, and if you're serious, if you're sincere, the Lord sees your heart and the miracle of salvation takes place in a moment. So if that's you and you know you need to surrender your life to Jesus, would you just say this? Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. That you lived a perfect life. And you were punished and died the death I deserved. I know that I've sinned and I know I need forgiveness. Today I repent of a life that has not honored you. And today I choose to surrender my life to your will. Today I declare that my life is yours from this day and evermore. Thank you for saving me, Jesus, and I will follow you. Friends, if you said that and you were sincere, you can be confident of what has taken place in your life. If you've repented of sin that you've allowed in your life, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, then friends, you're worthy to participate in communion this morning. So let's do so together. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus, he took the bread And he said, this is my body. And he broke it. He said, broken for you. And as we say, every time we do this, the picture of communion is the picture of a beautiful exchange. That Jesus allowed his body to be broken so that yours could be made whole. So when we take, we take in faith believing in this very exchange, his brokenness, so that he can make you whole. As often as you do, do so in remembrance of me, he said. Jesus, we thank you for your body that you willingly gave to be broken for us. We thank you. We thank you, O King, that you were broken so that we would be made whole. And I pray in the name of Jesus for the fruition of that to take place, even in this moment, in the lives of those who are here, even in the the broken who are partaking. I pray this would be a, a, a moment of a miracle for the sick who are here, that this would be a moment of a miracle in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take together. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant. That my blood would be poured out for the remissions of sin. And it was through the shedding of his blood, the shedding of his blood that would wash away the sins of the world. For any on whom his blood would be applied, their sins would be forgiven. If you have surrendered your life to to the Lordship of Jesus, his blood that was shed has been shed once and for all so that you could be forgiven. And as often as we take, we do so in remembrance of the fact that he gave all so that you could be free. So, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the representation that we have today, that we are partakers of what you provided, that your blood was shed so that we could be washed. So we do so. We do so receiving once again the cleansing that you provide. In Jesus' name, let us partake together.
And would you stand to your feet? We're going to go back into a time of worship. These altars are open. If something the Lord is doing in you is spurring you, we're going to have people ready to pray for you. I think that there's freedom in the house this morning. If you need freedom, if you need to experience the love of God, I'm telling you, he is ready to meet with you. And we are going to have people ready to pray with you to come forward as we begin to worship. Let's worship the Lord together this morning.